Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening to go over uh, the revised fiscal year 2021 budget. Hopefully, many of you have joined us over the past uh, couple of weeks when we've walked through various presentations on the upcoming budget. I think as we increasingly referenced over the course of those Facebook Live events, we expected some significant changes to the current budget for the upcoming or for the budget for the upcoming year and tonight and another event scheduled for Monday evening are really an opportunity for us to share with you uh, those details those revisions that we are planning to put forth to the Board of Supervisors on April the 22nd to reflect the uh, the necessary changes to the county's operating budget for fiscal year 2021 if you're just tuning in for the first time tonight Fiscal two, year 2021 begins on July the 1st. So that is the uh, the financial plan that we were talking about. As I've referenced here in the last just couple of minutes, we did come out with on March 11th, the county administrator's proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, days later, really uh, only hours later, the world changed dramatically and we have had to pivot dramatically in terms of our financial planning. Uh, the presentation tonight will walk you through those changes and then as we've done in the other seven Facebook Live events that have become necessary because of current COVID protocols, we will take all of your questions uh, here tonight that we get submitted. We also have the, still have the online uh, comment form that is open. Uh, we have been receiving some feedback over the last couple of days and getting responses to those individuals. So with that introduction, I'm gonna jump right into the presentation so we can maximize our opportunities for questions. So just want to spend a moment and there are really at this point an endless number of slides that we could point to to kind of point out the economic conditions and how they've changed so dramatically. I think this one, uh, albeit not a Chesterfield specific series, does a pretty good job of that. So what you're looking at on this slide and it's it, again, it's a, a somewhat irrelevant what the series is. It's really about the shape of the graph. You see plotted there in the blue line are travelers that are going through TSA checkpoints on a daily basis. The green line is that same activity for this window of time, mid-March all the way up into late April from uh, calendar year 2019. So we're averaging in the United States on a daily basis about two and a quarter million travelers per day. And you can see right there about, right about what we talked about, through the 10th through the 14th of March, about the time we were presenting this budget originally, you see a very, very sharp drop off in the number of travelers, air travelers every day, that taking it down to about 100,000 travelers a day. Uh, so I, we do not get revenue from, from airline travel, but I think this is just symbolic of the overall deterioration of the US economy. I think depending on what estimates you look at, between 25 and 30 percent of the U.S. economy is not struggling, but is shut down completely, and that is having dramatic impacts uh, on the rest of the economy as we know it. In, in Chesterfield County, uh, we got we get unemployment claim data on a weekly basis. We get it each Thursday. Uh, we got Thursday information earlier today. We got about 5,200, I believe unemployment claims for the last week to put that into some context for you uh, during calendar year 2019 we had 4700 unemployment claims for the entire year so just within this past week we exceeded uh, the total amount of unemployment claims that we had all of the last calendar year uh, we as, as we've talked about in numerous briefings on this topic, the, the data is, is almost unrecognizable, whether you're looking at national charts like the one before you or whether you're looking at some local uh, Chesterfield County information. Speaking of the job market, this chart looks at job advertisements, just March versus February. Again, this is a national series. You get much better information nationally. You see everything there, it really pivots around the 0%. So just within one month's time, even though the, the, the economic malaise is really centered in uh, industries like retail, restaurants, travel, 
you see really, regardless of what sector you look at, a pretty dramatic drop off in the number of job advertisements that are out there. And again, that's only for two weeks uh, out of a month. If you look at the national information on, on jobs and employment, we got uh, additional unemployment claims nationally this morning. And we've had about 16 to 17 million unemployment claims, new unemployment claims over the last three weeks. Unemployment, or excuse me, U.S. population, it's kind of hard to put that into co some context, so let me try to do so. That deterioration in the U.S. labor market over three weeks is equivalent to the job growth that we have posted over the last six to seven years. So a, a very good economy coming out of the last recessionary period, uh, a very strong labor growth, consistent labor growth, adding a couple hundred thousand jobs a month that has been wiped out in the period of three weeks. I think just again, and just hitting on a few of these things, just to try to put this uh, in context as much as humanly possible. Vehicle sales, again, this is a, a national series, but I think it speaks for itself. You see the dramatic drop off there. Uh, just within a, a couple of days time and this one starts to get a little closer to home in terms of where our revenues come from personal property is a big revenue driver for us it's something that's very elastic people can go and uh, stop buying cars obviously if you have concerns about your local incomes your household incomes and it also has a, an impact on valuation so you just see how quickly uh, things can deteriorate and we get that question a lot I and mean, I think it's a fair question why is this impacting you guys so so fast I think that's why we try to put charts up like this you look at vehicle sales uh, so this would be new lifeblood coming into the property uh, book in terms of vehicles and you can see how quickly that starts to deteriorate just from really one single data point uh, drops that down to uh, almost a minus 35 percent so let's try to drill down just into the local revenue impacts we talked about at the board's last meeting on april 8th what we thought we would be in terms of a revised revenue forecast when we were last together over facebook lives we were sitting at 773 on march 11th that seemed like a, a reasonable place to be a fairly conservative increase about a five percent budget increase over the current plan that's in place we are now looking from that figure from the, the proposed figure at 77773 a reduction of almost 50 million dollars in revenue spread across a variety of sources and i'll touch on those in just a second but just to kind of give you some again context i think is always important when we're going through a period of time like this in 2009 10 at least from a fiscal year perspective we dropped about 50 million dollars in revenue but we did that over two budgets this drop at least preliminarily would happen over the course of just a single budget adoption uh, at a drop of 50 million dollars so where is that occurring where do you see the deterioration in, in our revenue base again it comes from a variety of places they are uh, plotted out there for you in the table on the right hand side of this chart and i should mention i should have mentioned at the beginning all of these materials were posted this past friday on the blueprint site it's a uh, really a reader's guide version of a revised budget document we did not put out a 300 page piece we really tried to focus on where the changes are and really help to crosswalk anyone that became familiar with a revised budget or with the proposed budget what are the changes for the revised budget that we're going over tonight it's about a 12 13 page uh, packet of materials it's very very reader friendly very approachable go take a look at that uh, this presentation is also up there but you can go and see and we've got some line item stuff in there particularly on the revenue so you can see what our forecast is because we you know we want every, we want to be as transparent as we can with regards to uh, to those items so do go take a look at that we did a presentation or a version of this presentation last night for the board's virtual meeting that they did and then our calendar which we'll touch on a little at the end would have us coming back to the board of supervisors on april the 22nd for full adoption of this plan of this revised plan so you see negatives really all the way down on the far right hand column there in the variance column real estate taxes we are expecting 
not for this next six months, effectively, the second half of calendar year 2020, but for the revaluation activity that would occur January the 1st of 2021, we are expecting some deterioration, not only in residential values, but in commercial values. We value commercial real estate in the county uh, based on an income method. So as those properties generate less income, obviously that flows through to their valuation. So we we were looking for a modest increase of 3% as, as a blended measure. And we have now a 5.5% swing to a negative 25 in our forecast. The biggest decrease and, and not surprisingly comes in the uh, form of sales tax and hotel taxes. Those are two industries, retail trade, and, and hotels that, again, really fall into that 30% category have almost been entirely shut down, Sands, grocery stores, and some things like that. But you see a variance from proposed revised of about $19 million. Hotel taxes in particular, we're looking at a 60% reduction in hotel taxes. Um, there are some mechanics associated with that that we can get into if, if folks would like, but we pledge those revenues to the convention center. Uh, in a long-standing agreement, we are a, a part owner of that facility. So that will actually, the way that those mechanics work, even though that's a big number, um, that will not have an immediate impact for us in fiscal year 2021. But the longer this goes on, that will become somewhat of an issue. Interest income, which has treated us very kindly over the last uh, year plus 18 months or so, uh, we've seen short-term interest rates really fall almost into negative territory a couple times over the last couple weeks. So we've pulled that uh, back considerably as well. Uh, state revenues, we saw a modest decline here, but we do not have the state portion of this budget. We will not have the state portion of this budget in any great detail by April the 22nd. So we know uh, going into presentation tonight or even on April 22nd, we will have to come back to the board on May 27th and make an a additional set of amendments relative to state funding. That's more uh, impactful for the school division that has a much, much higher percentage of state aid and had very large increases in state revenue as they put together their original proposed plan. But we will not talk about that in any great measure tonight just because the state's going through the same exercise. So we're just uh, in, in an interest of transparency. We do not have those figures. Uh, we're showing some decline there. Schools will obviously have some decline, but we won't know those details until later on in May. So let's get to the expenditure side. I think as we've teed up in that side, we're looking for about a $50 million reduction. Where is that going to come from? How do you go about finding that as you comb through a budget that's uh, only a couple of weeks old? Uh, we start with this slide. I think it's really important to understand what's the philosophy going into it. And the quote there at the top of the slide is an excerpt from the county administrator's letter that's associated or attached to the packet that we put out on Friday. And it says very simply that our revenue outlook has changed, but our priorities have not. So when we go through the expenditure plan, we look for where are we going to try to find savings, things that we don't have to do, whether it be for a single year or forever, we are trying to keep those priorities in the front of our mind. And in Chesterfield County, longstanding commitments to education, public safety, and taking care of our physical plan. As we go through the rest of the slides, I think you'll see where uh, those things come out uh, through the rest of the presentation. The slide's a great example of that, public safety and education. The headline there, the headline, unfortunately, in many of the media outlets has been that the county reduced its support for local education. And that's true. Uh, however, the, the way that I would discuss that is it, the local transfer to Chesterfield County schools for the upcoming fiscal year, despite all of the economic news that we've discussed here tonight, is still planned on increasing by almost $10 million. So that is $2.9 million lower than the number we discussed just a couple of weeks ago. But when you're looking for $50 million of reductions and less than 3 million of that comes out of the school transfer line, uh, that's a plan that we stand here tonight and we are very proud of. And I think our school peers are, are we're relieved to get that information. The increase, the decrease rather, by formula would have been much larger than that, about another $5 million, 
We share in the rise and fall of property taxes in Chesterfield County. That's how schools are funded and have been funded for quite some time. But as we got a lot of questions during the latter stages of the original set of Facebook Lives, we were able to use $5 million in reserves to, to blunt uh, that decrease in school funding so that we were still increasing about $10 million. That by far, it was the largest increase in the budget anywhere, and now it is, is you know, off the charts in terms of uh, the number one increase in terms of this fiscal plan for fiscal year 2021. Uh, the school budget will have to be revisited. We don't have those state numbers. Again, it's about a 50-50 proposition. We will do that in May. Uh, we don't know how it's going to shake out on the state side, but we do know in terms of local support, $10 million more flowing to the school division uh, for the upcoming year. On the public safety side, a similar story. No impact to full-time sworn ranks in any of our three major agencies. And we have held on to a very small list of additional investments as part of this plan. And those really center in the public safety realm for us. And a couple of examples that we talked about last time, and I won't go into any great detail, overtime funding and fire. And in many ways, we, we feel that may be even more necessary than ever. There were a couple of initiatives in the police department to maximize the time and talents of our, our sworn officers so that they can go to those high priority calls. And then the only new positions in this plan from a general government side are in the sheriff's office, and that is to help maximize our local resources at the Chesterfield County Jail so that we can keep more local inmates here and not have to send them to Riverside Regional Jail, where there have been some concerns about uh, the condition and treatment of those inmates. I think those are well publicized. We talked about that the last time. We felt that was important enough to, to hold on to in this revised budget. On the capital side, kind of the third leg of that priority stool, if you will, uh, there are reductions here. There's no question about that, but the top line uh, item here, I think really speaks to it. We hold on to that two and a half percent policy level in terms of our commitment to major maintenance. And that's really, really important in terms of taking care of the physical plant that's already on the ground. We are hitting the pause button on adding new facilities or new large scale renovations. But in terms of our annual commitment to major maintenance, we are holding on to that even in, this, even in these challenging economic times. Part of the $5 million addition to the school transfer is to help them also position the school division to be able to do so. You go back to 2008, 9, 10, major maintenance was one of those areas that was hit uh, early and often uh, to try to get us through that storm. We don't want to repeat that because we've seen what some of the downstream impacts of those kinds of decisions can be. So part of the reason to put some reserves in place for schools is to help them maintain some somewhat of a major maintenance program as we head into fiscal year 2021. A lot, as we've talked about many, many times over many years, a lot of what we invest in capital is done so on a cash basis, and we are able to pull back about six and a half, six point one million dollars of that PAYGO funding stream into our capital program, still maintain the major maintenance policies like we just talked about. Some, so what columns, what categories, what projects are, are affected by that? Uh, we have been investing for many years into future land acquisition. Uh, we are pulling all of that funding back from a budgetary perspective. That doesn't mean that if uh, opportunities arise, we still can't consider those on a case-by-case -case basis, but we will not be budgeting those dollars as of July 1. We actually had overfunded our major maintenance goal just by a hair. Uh, we are at 2.8%, so we pull that back to the policy level. That frees up some monies. We're able to use some reserves, particularly in our transportation program. Also, there's a possibility that some of the state dollars uh, show up from the uh, new initiative that's been put in place for regional transportation projects. So between a combination of those events, that frees up some dollars as well. We're lo also looking to outright park some capital projects that uh, we have discussed previously. And examples of that would be renovation of buildings on the main campus here. Uh, the Beulah Elementary School site, which was to house Parks and Rec Administration, would also be put on pause. And when I say pause, I mean bringing those projects to a point where we, they have gone through a full design or programming 
uh, set of decisions so that when economic conditions improve, we can go back and we have a set of plans on the shelf and we can move those projects forward. No projects have been canceled at this time, but we're just trying to find a natural break point, a natural pause point for all of those items, put them on the shelf and come back to them when we can. Projects like the Melothian Fire Station that are safety sensitive, uh, we are moving forward with at this time, even though there will be additional operating costs once the, that station becomes operational. Uh, the last capital headline here, and I think this has been reported out a few places, is that the referendum timeline has also been put on pause. We're not saying November is off the table, but we're saying at this time it is not uh, an appropriate thing to move forward with in this economic environment. Uh, the debt markets are not necessarily operating as they uh, as they should, as we would like for them to, before we would go out and borrow considerable amounts of money. And it's just the additional costs associated with that. So there's a variety of factors. We've still got some time before we would have to make a final decision about when to position the next referendum. Uh, if it's not this November, then certainly next November is still sitting there. We've done all the work. I think we've got uh, broad consensus on what those projects would be. Now it's just a matter of picking the timing uh, for that slate of projects. We still have ways that we can borrow uh, for specific capital needs, and we're moving forward on a couple things. We mentioned the Lothian Fire Station already. Another good example would be uh, Crestwood Elementary School, which is a, one of the final projects from 2013 referendum, as well as the, uh, the Magnolia Green Area Elementary School, which we are going into the market in just uh, probably a couple of weeks or so to borrow for that project. There are uh, congestion and, and issues out in that portion of the county where we've had some growth over the last couple of years, and we need to move that project forward. So that continues to do so. Projects that are a little bit more administrative in nature, uh, we are putting, again, hitting the pause button for those items. So I think as you'll see, and hopefully uh, it, it is apparent to you as we go through the presentation, we haven't relied on a single uh, approach in order to rebalance this fiscal 21 uh, financial plan. We are looking and leaning on a variety of strategies, and I think that's a, an approach that we used back in 08 to 10 and served us well, and we're trying to replicate that here. Uh, there are a number of personnel items that we have uh, tweaked in order to generate savings. The 2% merit that we discussed uh, several weeks ago is removed for all county employees, and I would anticipate would happen the same thing on the school side. Uh, that does generate a significant savings for both sides of the organization. We have better intelligence on what our health care renewal rates are going to be. So we are not uh, changing the benefits necessarily, but the expected cost increase in January of next year, we have a better sense of what that's going to be. So we're able to pull back on that forecast a little bit. We are delaying the implementation of the pay study funding. We talked about this uh, at length several weeks back that we had two and a half million dollar reserve to begin to implement some of the pieces of the pay studies that are still underway. Uh, let me reiterate that the public safety and teacher pay studies have not been put uh, on pause, have not been put on the shelf. We're going to move forward with those and still have those recommendations available to us uh, whenever economic conditions normalize. But the deliberate action of putting two and a half million dollars in the budget has been removed. Uh, if economic conditions were to improve by mid-year, uh, that is something that we could revisit, and we'll touch on that a little bit more at the tail end of this presentation. Career development programs across general government have all been put uh, into a freeze status. Employees are still being encouraged to improve themselves and go out and get additional training and certifications, but we will not be offering financial incentives to do so at this time. Uh, we have instituted uh, over 600 furloughed positions, mainly part-time. That generates conservatively about $2.5 million in savings for the upcoming year. It also generates savings in the current fiscal year. We've talked about the fact that we're still facing three months of economic hard times in the current budget. So one of the reasons we moved very quickly uh, before you saw a lot of other agencies do so is we are trying to maximize the savings for the current year as well as the upcoming budget. But we've done this in a conservative way such that if conditions improve, uh, areas like libraries or parks and recreation that were hit uh, disproportionately hard by this decision, we would leave us some flexibility to reinstate some of those employees and begin that programming again 
or alternatively, uh, if economic conditions do not improve, we could increase that uh, number by making the furlough a more permanent status and uh, generate some additional savings if the economic conditions, if the economic winds blow the other way. We've also frozen an additional 40 full-time positions across the organization. Uh, we typically vacant, uh, we typically budget about 100 positions being vacant over the course of the year. We have added to that. That generates another two and a half million dollars of savings for the upcoming year. Departments uh, across the, the the organization on the general government side, in addition to the personnel items, have come up with some unique strategies that will also help us. Uh, travel, training expenses have been pulled back dramatically, vehicle replacements, as you might expect, some of which, just because vehicles, in, in many cases, aren't being used in the same way that uh, they have typically with being in the current operating status that we are. The fire department uh, had a large contribution to that. We did have some contingency funds as any good budget does in the original proposal, we have removed those. Those were largely around some contract items. We are not expecting to have as much volatility in some of those lines, so we removed the uh, contingency funds. And then we touched on, and I won't get into it uh, in any great detail, but the lodging tax, the less we take in on the revenue side, the less we pass through to the convention center authority. Again, there's no operational impact there, but if you go through the budget materials, you will see a large negative number associated with that. So just for, again, for transparency's sake, trying to uh, discuss that as much as we can. There was a, a lot of work as it goes into any budget for where are you going to spend the precious new dollars that were, are to materialize with any financial plan. That's where a lot of the public discussion and board discussion revolves around how are you going to improve the organization and that work still remains very very relevant to us none of the decisions that were made associated with that uh, are now invalid it's just that we do not have a revenue environment to support moving those initiatives forward at this time but what we've done is said we want to honor those pledges obviously all of them will have to be revisit to make sure the numbers are still relevant for whatever time they come back online but we have filed the full list of potential enhancements under three headings one of which and we talked about a little bit the public safety items still included in the revised budget the only thing that i would really add to that list would be investments in the registrar's office uh, we think we know that there's going to be some different voting procedures as we get into the fall and we want to have some resources available to support the registrar and the electoral board and their efforts. So that is, in addition to the public safety items, really the only thing that still remains from what we talked about two or three weeks ago. There's a separate list of things that would be considered during the fiscal year if funding becomes available. And then the balance of the items are left in a bucket called consideration for future years, things we don't feel like we can support in the upcoming budget but want to come back to as those first items that would be considered for fiscal year 2022, uh, roughly a year from now. This slide, not meant to uh, go through this in any great detail, but this is part of the materials we've posted on the website. It has every single enhancement that we had discussed with the public and, and provided great detail on. It shows how they are currently uh, being filed amongst those three categorizations that I just discussed. You do see the two and a half million dollars for the pay studies filed under uh, consideration in 21 if funding becomes available. Uh, this is going to be a, a moving target. I think we all realize that. So if conditions get better, and we certainly, certainly hope that they do, then that's something we could bring back to the board as those studies wrap up. And again, those studies are still in motion. There is no effort to slow either one of those pay studies down, either for teachers or for our first responders. In terms of next steps, in terms of calendar, uh, we have the Facebook Live tonight. We have another one, 7 p.m. on Monday night to, uh, to repeat this and take any additional questions if someone couldn't join us this evening. All of the materials are on our Blueprint website, which is uh, curated on a daily basis. It has every single file that we have posted up through the process. You can follow the buildup of a budget to 773, and then you will follow 
us down to where we are today, minus $50 million. Uh, and I should have mentioned earlier, I think, it, again, in terms of context, which I think is really important, that $50 million reduction not only comes off of the 773 number, but it actually would be below the current budget that's in place today. So just, uh, again, for a little bit of context. Budget adoption, again, we have to, by charter, have that in place by May 1. So uh, the Board of Supervisors did delay off of April 8th in order to us to have these Facebook Lives, to have the online uh, interaction with the community, to make sure that everyone understands what is being proposed. Uh, so we have gotten that out to all of our media sources. We're doing these tonight, and they have deferred adoption of the budget until April 22nd. Last night, they did adopt the tax rate. A slate of tax rates that underpin this budget in order to uh, begin that billing process. So that decision was made last night, but the overall budget itself is not adopted until April 22nd. So there's still time to uh, to make amendments and tweaks. And then to the extent we get new economic information between now and April 22nd, we will obviously make those changes as well. I think the first major amendment to this plan will be in, on May 27. That gives us over a full month to get the state information process it for not only the county but more so for the schools and to by the time we get to june one have a complete financial plan uh, that includes all of the information uh, including whatever we will receive from uh, from the state so that's more or less the timeline moving forward i, I did run through that uh, fairly quickly but uh, i'm happy to take any questions as we transition to that portion of the evening um, and so we got a few here, so that's fantastic. First question with the governor's announcement to postpone teacher raises, will the county reconsider their contribution in order to give teachers their uh, originally 2% raises? Uh, I, I do not believe that that will happen like we talked about in here. Our goal uh, in Chesterfield County is to uh, maintain the, the level of compensation that's in place today. I think adding additional cost except for the very, very select items that we talked about is not going to be an appropriate measure at this time. However, uh, we do recognize that teacher pay is one of those items, as I touched on in the presentation, that we would come back to uh, mid-course during the year if we can uh, see some improvement in our local revenue impact. We don't know definitively from the state that they would pull that money back as well. But certainly, as you've seen, the state revenue estimates, which continue to get worse on a day-by-day -day basis, they're looking anywhere from a $1 to $2 billion impact in a single year. I think the, the possibility of them offering uh, their portion of the raise is not going to be something that, uh, that you're going to see. In addition, it's not something that we would use one-time resources for to support an ongoing cost, as we've talked about in these sessions before. Uh, is there is the state giving any indication of when they will have their numbers to us? Is there a date the state has to act by? Uh, we, we expect as we move through the balance of April that our processes from a local perspective and a state perspective will run concurrently. Uh, so that's, that's, that's good. It just will not position us to adopt all of those state impacts uh, on April 22nd. And again, for the general government side, as we went through the last recession, we saw relatively minimal state revenue impacts uh, outside of a couple of key programs. So we, we are braced for that, and I think I should mention we, we are working on additional uh, expenditure reduction strategies, not only to be able to address whatever the state may or may not do on the general government side, but just the fact that the economic conditions on a day-to-day -day basis, I touched on the unemployment claims data that we just have received today, we have to be uh, leave ourselves in a position where we can pivot, where we can be nimble as we move forward in order to adjust on a day-by-day -a -day basis to whatever the economic news is. So we, even though this is a, uh, a plan that we believe in, I think it's a very solid plan. I think it's a plan that has a very good chance of carrying us through the entirety of the fiscal year. We do not stand here tonight or as we noted last night in the presentation of the Board of Supervisors, we are not resting on our laurels. We are continuing to look for other ways uh, to reduce costs so that we give ourselves a little bit extra cushion uh, as we head throughout the year because no one, no one uh, nationally or internationally knows when this is all going to be past us. And even if the virus were to recede completely tomorrow, no one knows what the shape of that recovery is going to look like. I think as we go 
uh, each week into this event, the chances of having that sharp overnight flip the switch kind of economic recovery uh, do drop and diminish every single day. So we have to, as the longer this goes on, I think there's sort of an exponential relationship between the longer the virus is with us to the extent the longer the recession is with us, and we have to be prepared for that. And that, that is the work that staff continues to do uh, every single day. Uh, question three that's popping up here, when pay studies are referenced, does that include both the police and teachers? Yes, it absolutely does. Uh, we are working for, uh, forward with both of those efforts. There is no uh, interest in stopping either one of those because we know there's still priorities. And we talked about the revenue forecast has changed, the priorities have not, and that includes both of those studies. So those are moving forward. Uh, we still expect to get those results back in late summer. Hopefully we're looking at a very different economic climate and then we can take those recommendations to the respective boards and committees for have them weigh in and then come forward with some uh, some strategies you know in january which is as early as we had really ever talked about again economic conditions are going to have to change dramatically from what is continuing to unfold on a day-by-day -day basis but the studies themselves do move forward uh, if the economy does improve into the fourth quarter of the calendar year is the board committed to implement the results of yes uh, a lot of questions on that Absolutely. Again, the priorities have not changed. Uh, neither the school board nor the board of supervisors has any ownership of this economic uh, crisis that we find ourselves in. We are doing everything we can, whether it's, and it's not just the teacher pay study or the public safety pay study, but there are, as we touched on in that one slide that goes through those, uh, the details of those three buckets, there are a lot of priorities on the school side, on the county side, in public safety, in support areas, in human services, wherever it might be, all of those items are important. All of those items are needed to support this community. And we want to revisit and implement all of those items, but we have to do so uh, in a responsible way, in a fiscally sound way. So we are at the mercy of the economy around us. We are not taking any of that information off the shelf, any of the hard work, any of the feedback, any of the collaboration that's occurred between the county and schools on any of those items. It's just the timing that's at question now. And, uh, and we hope that that timing uh, finds us sooner than later. Uh, question five, what has been learned from the 2008 recovery and, uh, and, and our approach to it that can be applied today? I, I touched on a couple of those things as we went through. And I think what served us well, one of the things that, uh, that we look to do here is a, a implement a multi-pronged approach. You can't rely on any one particular strategy because you leave yourself vulnerable to uh, that not producing the type of savings that you need. Uh, or some other condition shifting where you have to then pull back on that. So as you saw here, uh, we were relying on everything from not replacing vehicles to furloughs to less investment in capital on down the line. And then this additional list that we work on every single day has even uh, greater variety than what we've shown here tonight. So we stand ready if we are called on to make additional reductions uh, to our expenditure plan over the next several years. So I think that is uh, lesson number one. Lesson two, move very quickly. Uh, Chesterfield County announced its, uh, its furlough uh, situation on the general government side. Again, over 600 folks furloughed as of Monday of this week. Those are very, very tough decisions and have significant impacts on those households. And, uh, and we recognize that, but moving quick does maximize our uh, financial flexibility in the current quarter, as well as when we head into the first and second quarter of the upcoming fiscal year. So the, the sooner that you can move and position yourself, the better off that you're gonna be. I think on the opposite side of that, and I touched on, but it bears repeating, not looking at categories like major maintenance or things that down the line where you may have a short-term savings, but you're gonna have a long-term liability that has to be dealt with. So we're trying to be very mindful of implementing strategies that we think uh, can at least be held onto for a full calendar year and not just going to rack up a, a liability that we're going to have to deal with somewhere down the line when in, in most cases when you do that that number is going to be 
uh, much greater. It's going to be more expensive to deal with it some time down the line. So we are trying to not repeat those kinds of decisions that were made during the uh, during the last recession. And I think uh, the school major maintenance topic would be an example of that. And we've seen some good signs from the school division that they are looking to uh, to, to go in that direction. Uh, are, are schools lo also looking at areas to cut back from or hold off on to reduce co costs so we can retain all our teachers? Absolutely. We've had uh, daily calls with them, daily interactions with uh, the school division. They are looking at many, many of the same strategies that we've touched on here tonight. Uh, I won't speak to all of those. I'll let them go through them in great detail, but just rest assured that uh, uh, the superintendent and his staff and the school board are taking a very hands-on approach to this. Uh, they are not waiting around. They are looking for ways to save money uh, every single day in order to put themselves, again, in a better situation for the balance of this budget as well as what's coming up on July the 1st. Uh, they are, again, at much greater uh, risk in terms of what the state does. They are going to wait and see how those numbers shake out, and I think you'll see the school board take up and, and really go into more detail on the strategies that they want to deploy once they see what those state figures are going to be. But uh, we, we have great confidence in what they're doing in terms of their current year budget reduction strategies. And I think when we get to the end of the fiscal year, we should find all of ourselves in a, as good a place we can be in this current uh, fiscal environment. So uh, we do thank for their uh, continued partnership on that front. Questions are still populating here, and I see something about furloughs and rifts. We, there are no, at this time, and I, again, I can only speak to the general government side because we're a little bit ahead of them process-wise, as would be expected, there are no reductions in force associated with this proposed budget that we're talking about here tonight. We have gone the, the furlough route wherever possible, uh, and most of those decisions revolve around services such as parks programs or library services where we just can't safely offer that program or operate those facilities. So that became a sort of a natural place to go to uh, in terms of savings, but it's, we're going into that uh, with the understanding another place would be, uh, you know, courthouse security. There's just not as much activity there. We've pulled back a little bit. So we've tried to match up where we're taking our reductions to what the actual conditions on the ground are and not taking a reduction in force approach would permanently eliminate positions uh, because we hope to turn those things back on as economic conditions um, change. Again, that would be a little bit different strategy also from the last time, but we're trying to respond to the economic event that's before us. Um, I think schools and is, is from what uh, we've discussions that we've had. Again, I can speak to all of the details of their plans, but I think they're taking a very similar approach, trying to sort of hunker down, hoping that this, uh, this blows over us and that it was a very different kind of event. Again, the economy was not in bad condition in any way, shape or form on March 11th. Uh, it has deteriorated fast since then, but again, there's still some hope that it can bounce back sooner than it otherwise would. And so I think you see a little different approach there. So I, we are staying away from the reduction in force wherever possible, trying to go more the furlough route, which is more temporary. And I think you've seen others, public and private sector, follow suit. A couple other questions popping up, and I uh, so apologize for the delay. We are, we are sorting through those. We are working a, a skeleton crew in here tonight, as, as you might expect. But uh, if you don't get your question answered here tonight, and uh, it's about a uh, quarter till eight, we will take a few more questions and see what pops up here. Please, uh, if something dawns on you, something you want to know, uh, even if it's just a comment, uh, you can always use the form that's online. All of that information is, uh, is shared with the board supervisors. And we try to get back to folks that have a unique question that we haven't answered in some other way or point them towards some resources that are posted on the Blueprint site or, or elsewhere. So that will remain open uh, through the end of the close of business on April the 21st, the Tuesday before the Board of Supervisors is scheduled to take up this plan. So please, please use that tool. Uh, we've gotten some good feedback on it the last couple of days. It worked well the last time around. 
uh, so you can use that to uh, to share your thoughts with the board. Um, obviously, we have another Facebook Live event that we'll be hosting on Monday uh, to answer any questions or pick up any audience that weren't able to be with us tonight. When will the 2020 real estate tax rates be announced? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the board did adopt the full slate of rates last evening uh, as they had been advertised and there was no changes to any of the rates uh, primarily the, uh, the the one that draws the most attention is the, the real estate rate was left at 95 cents uh, the personal property rate was left at three dollars and sixty cents so no change in the rate schedule there uh, obviously the 95 cents when we put that out originally was expected to uh, to be productive in terms of revenue generation, but as we shared in the early stages of tonight's presentation, we are expecting to see some deterioration uh, in the underlying values, uh, particularly on the commercial side, but also residential as we move through the year. Those values, again, will not be reset until January 1st of 2021, but at that time, uh, so that part of the thinking was leaving the 95 cents there was helping us uh, be able to shoulder some of those reductions that staff feels like from an economic perspective we'll be facing uh, come January. So it does put us in, in closer to a revenue neutral situation from the increases that will happen during the first half of the fiscal year to that pivot that will occur. Uh, even if the economy is, is starting to look better, the considerations for setting those values for January 1st happen over a longer window. So the 95 cent does position us to be able to weather this storm uh, a little bit better over the course of an entire fiscal year. Why are health care costs for both employer and employee contributions continuing to rise? Uh, it's a fair question. Chesterfield County uh, as a as a joint overall uh, capital C organization is self-employed, but we have had a very, very good run in terms of our increases in premiums, which are shared between uh, the the administration side and the employee side. So that's that we've held that way for for many years. But moving to a self-employed status and having a large pool of participants, county and schools, has kept our renewals at, a, at much less than many of our peers, public and private sector. So that approach has uh, has worked very well and has minimized any benefit changes that we've had to put into place. And the message earlier tonight was uh, because of the uh, participation and experience we've had as part of that plan being self-insured, we are expecting a, even a lower increase for uh, health care premiums are on a calendar year basis. So that would not reset again until January. Similar to real estate values, we are expecting a lower increase in those premiums for January of 2021. So that's part of the savings that come out in this budget has no impact on the benefits side uh, and has less impact on uh, on those folks that are contributing to that. But it's really just based on the, our experience as a overall organization in terms of healthcare, which is, again, has been a very, very successful collaboration for county and schools. So I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the nod. We're we're sort of drying up on questions. That's that's okay. Uh, we will continue to monitor the Facebook feed even after we uh, we flip the switch here tonight. And again, that what we did uh, the last time around, we started off our next Facebook live with a lot of those questions that might come in after the fact. So if your question again didn't get answered, it, uh, it's not intentional we will circle back to that either with you individually or we will use that to uh, to start off our event which is scheduled in this room same uh, same channel if you will on monday evening the uh, the 13th at 7 p.m um, so that's that's where we rejoin again use the online form go out and check out all the budget materials it's not our our normal lengthy document all that information is still up there but all of the relevant changes are laid out in great detail as part of the uh, the miniature budget document that's uh, out there on the blueprint website so please take a look at that and, and all, as always you can email us at blueprint at chesterfield.gov about any of these topics where to find materials something else that you might be interested in we do monitor that account uh, around the clock and are happy to get back to you. So lots of ways to participate, lots of ways to get a hold of us, COVID or no COVID, we are, we are here to, uh, to answer your questions. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off tonight's event. We do appreciate you very much for being with us, for being patient, for being understanding, and uh, we hope to talk to you very soon. Y'all stay safe. Thank you very much.